Please hand in your notes, first of all. I hand in your notes, and I hope you remembered your essay about how to help people learn better pronunciation. It's not just pronunciation, learn better English, listening skills, speaking, grammar, everything goes together. But something that's reality based, something that's practical, something we could actually do. And also your vowel plotting assignment, plotting the vowels. And how are you with the logarithms tutorial? Did everybody finish it? Everybody, uh, Jerome, how about you? The logarithms tutorial? OK, can you do that before Wednesday? It won't take that long. I'm sure you'll find it quite easy. And you're OK? And Bella OK? Annie, yeah. All right, so make sure that you finish that. And maybe next Monday we'll do, we'll do the decibels tutorial as well. And that will be not so hard once you understand logarithms. And very quickly, I'm going to share some books with you. One I brought last time and forgot to take out. This one is by a phonetician named Ann Cutler. She's, I would say, a high profile phonetician in the field. I met her at a big phonetics conference last summer in Hong Kong. Last or the summer before in Hong Kong. And she has written a book called Native Listening, Language Experience and the Recognition of Spoken Words. Note the title Native Listening. When we're talking about Ting Ni, we're always thinking of it, mostly thinking of it, as something needed in ESL or in foreign language teaching, right? Foreign language teaching. Rather than something that we need to think about for our own language because it happens so naturally and so easily in our own language that we just don't give it that much thought. But in this very rigorous and scholarly book, she has studied how we process spoken language, how our ears, how our brains process language in our own language, so native listening. And it's very dense, but I think it's brilliant because I think we need to understand native listening before we're going to be able to address foreign language learning, listening in foreign language learning. We need to know how the process works in our native language. And that will tell us a lot about how we can improve our teaching of foreign languages and our learning of foreign languages. OK, so Ann Cutler's Native Listening, Language Experience, and the Recognition of Spoken Words. Just got this. This just came out. It's quite new. There's another book I'm going to throw in. I recently got that big order from Amazon that I told you. And this one, I think, is totally brilliant. It looks like it's unrelated to what we're doing. It's the new rules of posture, how to sit, stand, and move. Now, that sounds a little unrelated to phonetics. And I've just started it. I have a whole bunch of books going at the same time. And the introduction is positively brilliant. And I will just read a little part of it to you. And I wonder if you will be able to understand why I mentioned this book in this class, this many of my classes. She's talking about internal closure. That means we get really tightened up inside whenever we're, we feel threatened or whenever we're not sure about what's going on and we want to protect ourselves. We get all tense and tight inside. And that makes us swallow your like xiao. So when you get older, you get shorter and shorter, right? OK, well, she's talking about this and how this leads to poor posture. Very often when we're talking about posture, people will say, put your shoulders back, stand up straight. That's what they tell you is good posture. And I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying that that's what a lot of people tell us to do, but it's uncomfortable. And then we go back to what we were doing. This book is addressing posture from the inside because she says it's these internal, deep muscles that give us our sense of balance and our freedom of movement. And I'll just read a little bit and see if you can kind of get what I'm what I'm um, talking about here. And we're talking about here, if we want to open a jar, right? If you want to open a jar, you unconsciously stiffen muscles along one whole side of your body, right? Because you want to hold the jar tight, and then you want to get the cover off. 
to help immobilize the jar. We want to keep, actually I was doing this side, I'll probably hold it with my left hand and this whole side will get very tense just to hold that jar in place so we can turn the lid. In a similar way, when you walk, the muscles of one leg contract, shou that means to provide an instant of stability so your other leg can swing forward. So when you're going like this, you're going to make your muscles really stiff so that you can have stability to move around with the other leg. Our muscles wrap around our skeletons in layers like layers of clothing. In general, the outer muscle layers provide the visible motions of the arms, legs, and trunk while deeper muscles provide support for joints and internal organs. Contraction of these deep muscles lets us create the stability we need to control our actions. If we are well oriented to our surroundings, that means if we understand and we have a very good knowledge of the space around us about how hard or soft the floor is and what walls are in our way and so forth, we can stabilize ourselves in ways that allow our bodies to remain open and expressive. And we all want to look open and expressive rather than like this when we talk to people, right? Because otherwise people think, oh, ta, how xiao qi oh. Xiao qi meaning in, with your personality, bu kai lang. But if orientation is insufficient, we compensate by stabilizing too much. So if we don't know enough about our surroundings, then we will get all stiff to be ready for anything because we don't know what's out there, what we have to prepare ourselves for. Got it? Sort of get it? That means if we don't have enough information about our surroundings, we have to be stiff to be ready for anything because we don't know exactly what's there. So we just get stiff to protect ourselves from everything. In other words, we panic. It's a kind of panic. We contract our muscles in ways that diminish our dimensions, making our bodies shorter, narrower, or flatter, and effectively closing them. We're closing ourselves up to protect ourselves because we we're afraid because we don't have enough information. We do this by means of subtle contractions of muscles that lie in the deep layers of our bodies. These inward protective stabilizing acts are as expressive as any outward gesture, like the traffic cop's outstretched hand that signals stop. So if you see a traffic cop going stop, you're going you're gonna to step on the brake immediately. You know exactly what he means, don't move. And when we tighten up our internal muscles, we're also giving other people this signal, don't get too close. I'm really, I'm really scared. I'm really stiff. Okay. Uh, such internal closure compresses our joints and internal organs and limits our capacity to adapt to life's demands. Here we're getting closer to what I'm driving at. If we're all scrunched up and all tight and all contracted, it limits our capacity to adapt to life's demands. We can't just step in and dance. We can't just step into a conversation or make a joke because we're all tightened up. So that means do you see where I'm going? Okay. By steeling ourselves in relation to events in the world around us, we build little by little poor movement habits and unhealthy posture. Because we're always afraid and always panicking, we get in the habit of being like this. So, and also, we are not ready to adapt and to deal with the world. Following me? We accumulate these habits of internal closure through our repeated attempts to stabilize our lives. Whenever we want to keep things stable so that we're not afraid and that we can handle things and we won't be in trouble, we'll be safe, we just get in the habit of being tight all the time because that seems to protect us and we get into a habit of doing it. Whenever we feel overwhelmed, we experience some degree of deficiency in our perception of the ground. Our surroundings are both. So whenever we feel like, that's being overwhelmed. The resulting insecurity arouses a basic fear, the fear of falling. This in turn increases our need to stabilize our bodies. So the conclusion I drew when I was reading this this morning, I thought, this is really great. I put a big star by it. Why? Because this is how I see Taiwanese reacting when they have to speak English. <laughs> Right? Because you're all steeled up, you're all tightened up, because you want to protect yourself. Oh my God, I have to speak English. <gasps> what were those words I, re I memorized? Uh, chair, uh, you, you said chair, whatever it is. We panic. And because we are so stiff, we're not able 
to act smoothly and naturally because we are so stiff, we're panicking. So what it's saying about our reactions to not knowing the lay of the land, the lay of the land just means zhou wei huan jing. We react by protecting ourselves in a very general way so that we're protected for everything, but we're unable to loosen up and interact in a relaxed way with the world. That's what happens to people in Taiwan. I see it immediately. As soon as they see me coming, <gasps> it happens so often. I see it. Just being a white person walking around in Taiwan. If I go into a store, I told you that story. It's not just there, but if I go to any situation where they see me coming and they're afraid, oh my God, I have to speak English. I see that whole reaction. You all know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's why I think this is really brilliant. She was talking about the way we hold ourselves, the way we carry ourselves with our body, and how it often makes us, it gives us pain because we're always in a bad position, those muscles get really tired, and then eventually yao suan bei tong and all these other problems happen. Well, we have the same problems in Taiwan English because you're so stiffened up, you can't hear, you block out what you're hearing. Grasping at straws, you learn to say, you hear the words, you can make it up to you that you think it might be the word that you can make it up. You might have lost a lot of information. Just because you're too stiff, you just grab at a few things that you can catch in that very stiff state. Your hearing is almost blocked. You don't hear how they're saying things. You're just grab, grabbing at things that you can when you're really nervous. Do, do you guys see what I'm saying? You're, you're just kind of reacting very subtly. So I don't know if you really got it or not. Can anybody give me some feedback so far, if you understood what I said and see some connection there? Carol? Um, I'm thinking about what you said about uh, we grasp a few words that we hear. And but I, I think it's quite normal if your English is not so good. And you just are focusing on focus on few words that mm. you already you recognize and try to make up a min, meaning for it. It's, I think it's uh, quite normal. It is, but where does it come from? In other words, when you're having to listen and understand, do most people have training in that? in listening and getting meaning out of what they understand when they're unprepared? Do most people have training that in, in that in Taiwan? No? I mean, this is my experience of teaching at Taida so long. We get the very best students, still right? And when they hear, they're grabbing words so they can't hear how they're saying it. So if somebody says, oh, what's your name? Ah, my name is Jan, they panic. 明明听到的是name,可是发音没有进去,它是抓到了名字这个idea,所以出来的还是错误的发音,因为它没有办法利用它所得到的资讯让自己进步, because they're too stiff. They're blocking out almost everything except for little bit, bits and pieces they think will help them survive. Because you're so nervous, you're not even getting... See, normally, if I hear somebody saying something different than the way I do, I change immediately. For example, how do you say um, 一倍两倍 the 倍, 不是个人字旁吗, 那个倍, 然后左边那个人换成一个火, how do you say that word? Uh-huh, but a lot of people say? Right, okay. So I was speaking with somebody and she said 那个烘焙的东西,一直在说烘焙, 我说可是烘焙的东西怎么样? 那她马上又跟人说可是烘焙的东西怎样? She heard me say 烘焙, she adjusted immediately. That's just an example. Now, she was a native speaker of Mandarin, but she could hear that other, another person had a different version. She adjusted to me immediately, because in your native language, you're not panicking. You're at ease. You're able to deal with it, because when you hear it, it's all automatic. So you're going to use all the inf most of the information that comes in, not just grabbing it, meaning, Right? You should be able to do that in a foreign language. If, if, if I say, what's your name, you shouldn't say, my name is Jen. You should be using my information to improve because I'm a native speaker, so I'm, apparently I have some credibility, right? When you're stiff like this, you can only you limit yourself as to what bits you can get from the message coming in. 
You could be getting a lot more information. You could be at ease making the other person feel more at ease. And you would both enjoy it a lot more. But because of that panic, it's not just that you don't know the words. It's the panic. It's the panic, just like it says, it limits your range of motion, right? You're just going to be very limited. It's that kind of panic that limits what you're getting from the outside world in language. Okay, now, now do you sort of see what I'm saying? Yeah. Miranda, does it make sense? That's right. You got the key to it right there. When we are unprepared. That's what we have to look at. Why are we unprepared? The reason that we get these bad habits with our body is because we haven't practiced doing it a better way. And in this book, which I haven't gotten into yet, I've only gotten through part of the introduction, but I have a feeling I'm going to really like this book. She teaches you how to feel things naturally. You can feel where the center of gravity is in your body. And rather than just following very Kebanhua, the instructions, just stand up straight. She says, that's not what you do. You feel inside your body the relationship of your body to the floor and to the walls and everything else. Then you can adjust yourself naturally and correctly based on your surroundings because you're aware of your surroundings. So she teaches you awareness so that you're ready to use the information from your environment to give yourself the right posture. Now, that teaches you how to be prepared. The whole point is, why do Taiwanese English, uh, people who speak English as a second language, why do they come to these situations unprepared? They've been studying English for nine years. Why are they unprepared? That's the question. The whole point is, we're not giving them the right kind of preparation. If they've been studying for nine years, why are they unprepared? Because they have not been given the right kind of training with the right attitude. It's not just just like it's not just following stiff instructions about posture. It's having the ability to benefit from all the input and to listen properly. When you relax, and for example, that's why I promote the echo method, you give yourself a where it can come in, you can process it. You have time to process it. You hear not only you also hear the vowel is A, it's not A, because you have that So you learn a relaxed way of dealing with language when you are practicing, when you are doing your studying. So when you get into a real situation, you're used to processing more of the message rather than grabbing it, a few words that you recognize. Do you see what I'm saying here? So if you've gotten in the habit of processing almost the whole message in a relaxed way, you're not going to panic. There are words you don't know, you just ask. Rather than saying, oh, my name is, you know, something like that. So we need to be relaxed. So all that information is coming in. Just like if you are getting better at posture, you're going to be processing more information from your environment so you do the right things with your body. It's not a perfect analogy, but there are a lot of parallels. OK? Anyway, I wanted to share that with you. I got so excited when I was reading it over breakfast this morning. I thought, yes, we need to teach people how to relax, how to let things in, process them, and be more at ease. And then when you're speaking with somebody, they will be much more comfortable and the whole thing will go better. OK, and this, this kind of training has to start from the very beginning. So that's sharing a different book. Um, that's why it's really important to read things outside your field all kinds of things. You'll find parallels. If you're just reading things in your own field, people get stuck in ruts very easily. basis. You're going to get stuck, and you're going to miss this stuff on the side. So you really should be when it comes to reading. Find stuff in a different area completely, and you think, wow, there are parallels here, and I bet this could contribute to this field, and people aren't looking at that. So it gives us a very fresh angle to look, things, look at things from. OK? All right, we're going to go to our work. Now, you may think that this stuff makes us fall behind in our schedule. But personally, I think this stuff is equally important. It's equally important to get you thinking in these other directions. Because if we just 
shove all that content into you, that's the same thing that happened in your public education. And that's one thing that I find really needs to be changed. One idea I had talking with my son these days, he's just going to the States. So he's home now organizing his stuff. And we're talking about computers a lot because that's what he does. And I said, you know what we should do? Because he was saying that it's very hard to find people who have good programming skills and other computer skills. You hear about the is it because there are no jobs? Where my son is going to Silicon Valley, he says there are many, many jobs that are not being filled. Many, many good jobs that pay very well. Much, much more than I make here. Well-paying jobs that are not being filled because Because, yeah, they can't find people who are good at programming, who think out of the box, who are creative, who can solve problems. They, people just don't have these skills. It seems to me that if there are now so many good jobs in this area, we should be preparing children differently for life. Rather than just memorizing the contents of textbooks, having them do lots of shiti for math. I mean, math is very important, no question. But having them just master the, the content of textbooks does not prepare them for these jobs at all, really. My son says, well, when they get to the Yenjo Suo, we have some people who are very good. Yes, by Yenjo Suo, then you will get Bijiao Zhuan Yan Shu Nian. But this stuff has to start in Zhong Xiao Xue. So I said, how about if we have fourth graders learn Python? Do you know what Python is? Have you used it? Uh, no. It's last. Uh, Last no, 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 when I was in, uh, when I was a sophomore. Sophomore at Taida. Yeah. Right. Are any schools, Zhong Xiaoxue, talking about high schools and elementary schools, are any of those schools teaching Python? Uh, we don't even teach how to uh, program in, how to program in high schools or elementary schools. That's right. So I said to my son, I said, how about if we start teaching fourth graders Python? If you've, know, if you've tried Python, you know it's very user friendly. It's very easy to shang so. It's really easy to get into. I mean, even I did some for a while. I found a group that teaches Python to linguists. linguistics And those people were really good. This should start at fourth grade. Why fourth grade? Well, just a little Fourth grade, no problem. You can learn Python. That's just an example. We need to be training kids differently for future challenges. Now, my thing is English, so we also need to be teaching correct listening, relaxed listening, not panic listening, from an early age. These are things they need in the world. We need to start early. We obviously have to change the way we teach kids. Tianyashi. I know it's a cliche, but tianyashi de jiao yu. All you get is somebody who passively eats up a lot of stuff, spits it back for the test. That's all we get. They are not suited to getting these high paying jobs. They haven't been trained in the things that they need for these jobs. All right, so all of these things are making me think deeply. If we want to change, if we want to improve things in Taiwan, because Taiwan has so many wonderful human resources that are being told, don't ask questions in class, because I'm going to get irritated if you ask questions in class. When we've got smart people who are being told don't ask questions and they're not being given basic training in the things that lead to good jobs, we're really, we're really under-exploiting our human resources here. You know, and holding a lot of people back who could be doing much more, not always following. Taiwan is generally just following. Whatever America develops and Europe develops, Taiwan just I'll do it too. Because they're not able to do it themselves because people aren't trained to think that way. Not because the people here are less smart. All right, this really is a huge, huge thing. I mean, I think about it a lot. And I hope you all think about it a lot because you're the young people who can make a difference. Well, we're going to go to our work now, finally. OK? So our main goal today is just to get through as much of chapter 8 as we can. And we will have some, we will have some um, tutorials in addition to the Decibels tutorial, there are other web pages we're going to be doing, but we need to get through more of the text. Okay, whose turn is it? Okay, we're on page.
Page 198, and it's the last paragraph about halfway through, starting with as the lips. As the lips come farther apart. Farther apart, unless it's a compound or a shi zi, then make sure that you stress all of the shi zi. And apart is also a shi zi here. Farther apart. Farther apart, mm -hmm. and the vocal tract shape changes. Mm? Changes. The formal will. Mm -mm -mm. The vocal track uh, the vocal trap shape changes. The formal will mm -hmm. changes. Okay, your your vowel wasn't bad. Change, but do we remember the rule? What what's the rule? Tell me quick. The last sound of the singular is. The last sound of the word change is what. Is the sibilant. It's a sibilant, therefore? Uh, changes. Right, we need an extra syllable. All right, now when we're learning those things from <laughs> Shida, I have to ask you, those articles, do you sometimes feel that it's just a bunch of stuff that we have to memorize for tests or something? Or do you realize about how important it is to apply it? I'm just wondering if you, as advanced students, if you realize how practical and important it is, or do you think it's just a bunch of other stuff we have to learn? Take notes on. Vivian? I, I think it, uh, it tells us uh, some uh, rules that uh, we can apply, apply in our uh, pronunciation. OK. So you're aware when you're doing it that this is for actual use. It's not just more theory that we have to memorize for the test. And by the way, I'm sorry I didn't think of this earlier and I didn't put it in my um, teaching plan for today, but I'm going to add it. There is a new article up now, 十的第十一篇已经上传了. So please read it, add it to your notes for next Monday. It's part two of the previous article, which is on nasals. And you know most of this stuff because you've heard me say it in class. But read it over carefully and take notes, because that will help you solidify what we've gone over, sometimes only quickly in class. So Shida, um, it's the piece number um, 11, and it's issue number 78, but you will see it on, on the website. Um, it's on the Shouye. Just click on how to learn English well. Shouye, right? Shouye is how to learn English well. Then you will go to the list of articles that are available. So add that one to your notes for next Monday. And that's about nasals. OK, changes, go. The formants will move correspondingly. As we saw, so in the saw. saw. What is so? How would we spell so? S-E-W or S-O or S-O-W. It's a sangadonian so. Yigusufong, S-E-W. 一个是播种, S-O-W, 一个是那么so, right? All of those are so. This one is so. saw. Everyone saw. saw. Mm -hmm. OK. As we saw in the section on perturbation theory. 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 Good. In figure 8.2, mm -hmm. closure of the lips causes a ca ca uh -huh. causes right. a lowering of all the four O the foreman. Okay, we're having trouble with ah and o, and most of the things I corrected here are ah and o. So, can you find all the ah words in this sentence? Ka causes. When you when you see it, think of a wu ya. How does a wu ya call? Ka 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 causes causes. All right, sa causes. And how about the o words? Closure, not your closure. Good. And? Lowering. Lowering. So make those two really clear in your head. They're entirely different vowels. O is a shuang mu yin. Even though you just write O and KK, it's a shuang mu yin. It's a diphthong. So lowering, closure, saw, causes. So the diphthong O and then the open O, ah. I want you to read the sentence again, please. As we saw in the section on perturbation theory, 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 right, and figure eight point two, good, the closure of the mm -hmm. closure of the 
uh, oh, closure of the lips. Of the lips. Of the lips. Right, that's the end of the subject, right? So we pause. C causes. Good, very good. Lowering okay. of all the formants. All, all. All 也是属于 all， 可是 l 让它有点变，不是 all。Some people say it that way. All, all. Everyone, all. All right, that one's probably a little more Minnesotan than some things because remember I told you, I have a very slight distinction between all and all. 这是一个工具不太不太常用的一个词 I have a very very tiny distinction which you don't need to learn, but that maybe makes my ah more open than some people. I say all all. Look at my mouth, all all all. Okay, I'm overdoing it now. All. All, all, all. Hanjin, you don't have to learn this distinction. I just do it to illustrate that before L, this sound, especially for me, it will get more open. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw causes all. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw causes all. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw causes all. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw causes all. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw causes all. It doesn't sound like ah, like saw Well, because well, anytime we pause, we're going to have a continuation rise, even if it's a an example word. The syllable ba will begin with the performance <laughs> in a lower position. In a in a good lower position. 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 Good. And will be distinguished by their rapidly rising rapidly to the rap that rapidly good rising to the positions for it at. Okay, very good. But watch positions, not positions. Positions, positions. good. Similarly, in the syllable ab, 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 not a, ab, ab, ab. Uh huh. Ab, ab, good. The formants in a will descend as the lip closure is formed. Whenever a stop is formed or released,、mm -hmm. there will be a particular shape of the vocal tract. That will be ca characterized by particular form and frequencies. Very nice. You improved so much. The reading was really very nice. Particular. Some people say particular. You don't really need the R. Particular, particular. Don't call you. Everyone, particular. Particular. The thing I noticed here, though, is Q, not particular. It's particular, particular, or particular. Don't call you.、Um, let's just make sure we understand here. Let's go back to the beginning of the paragraph. So remember that each of the stop sounds conveys its quality by its effect on the adjacent vowel. 就是旁边的那个母音会受到这个子音的影响 So mainly the way we hear stops is not through the consonants themselves, but through the through the vowels that are right next to it, because those vowels will change subtly as they get closer to the vowel or as they leave that vowel, as they slowly move away from that vowel. So we saw that during A vowel such as e, there will be formants corresponding to the particular shape of the vocal tract. These formants will be present as the lips open in a syllable such as b. So we start with b, and that's going to affect the beginning of e because our lips are just done making the b in e. So the beginning of e will be different in b from what it would be in e. E and b, e the kaido 不一样，因为 b 的关系 that's only normal. They will have frequencies corresponding to the particular shape that occurs at the moment the lips come apart. So, as soon as we separate our lips from the b, b, it's changing the format of that e. 本来母音有固定，可以说是有固定的 format。可是，一加上左右不同的音的话，那个 format 会受到那些音的影响。So the formants will change <coughs> as the lips come farther apart and the vocal tract. Shape changes. The formants will move correspondingly. So, b, 嘴唇那个开的越来越大，离得越来越远。所以 formants 一直不断的也在变。And all of those changes give us information about if that was a b or a g or a d. The way we hear the beginning of that e in this case, right? As we saw in the section on perturbation theory. And figure eight point two closure of the lips causes what? A lowering of which formants?、Uh, one, two, or three. Look in your book; it's right there. All of them, yes. 
So when we close our lips because it's at that velocity point, right? Want to remind ourselves, was it, was it velocity, was it a V? It's on page 192. The lips are a V point, right? And whenever we narrow that passageway, we're going to lower all of the formants. Consequently, that means therefore, the syllable be will begin with the formants in a lower position because of the but because the lips were together, because that lowers all the formants. So the beginning of a eh is going to have lower formants than a just a plain a. Eh. If it's just a plain a, eh, the formants will be higher. But if it's a eh attached to an initial b, the beginning of that a eh is going to have lower formants, right? That part I think is really clear. Similarly, in the syllable eb, and that is a real word, eb and flow, just a tui chao de shi e b b, eb, right? And we're at an ebb, that means the formants in e will descend as the lip closure is formed. So in the previous example, e starts with lower formants and the formants slowly get be. Because of the b, at the beginning of e, the formants are lower, they start lower. But as we get further into the vowel, be. You have to watch me? Be. At the beginning, the formants are low because of the B, but then slowly the formants will get higher because our lips are getting further apart. We don't have that effect of closed lips lowering the formants. If we reverse the process, we get something similar in reverse. For example, in ebb, we start out with a pretty normal e, eh, e, eh, but now we're moving towards b. So we start out with fairly high formants, relatively speaking, and we're going to get increasingly uh, increasingly lower formants because we've just reversed the process. And by both of those processes, which are really the same in reverse, that helps us This pro <coughs> process of <coughs> hiring or uh, hiring, I guess we can say, and lowering formants helps us distinguish what? The consonant, the stops, right? We can hear if the formants are going higher or lower. Our ears are really sharp. It's all subconscious for most people, but we notice it, and right away we know that's a b, and it's not a t, and it's not a g, OK? Mm. Whenever a stop is formed or released, there will be a particular shape of the vocal tract that will be characterized by particular form and frequencies. So that's just telling us that based on what our ears perceive as higher or lower, lower formants, we're going to be able to identify that stop pretty well. OK? Good, let's keep going. When you say, mm? you yao fang zhong yin ma. When you say, right. bib or bab. Bab. Bab, for example, Good. the tongue will be in the position for the vowel. For the for the uh -huh. vowel even when the lips are closed. Even when the lips even when the lips uh -huh. are closed. Closed. Closed uh -huh. at the beginning of the word. Beginning. 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 Good. I'd like you to read that starting from the tongue. Uh, the tongue will be in the position for the vowel. For the for the vowel, vowel, for the vowel, right? Even when the lip, even because even is, 是不是很强调的一个字？甚至怎样怎样 ？You will stress it probably in Chinese as well. So things you would stress in Chinese, stress in English because they're important. Even when, even when the lips are closed. Once more, even your end. Once more, even right. when the lips are closed, at the beginning of the word. At the beginning there we go of the it. word very good watch that because it changes the whole tone of what you're reading if you read beginning because it's very very colloquial now does this strike you as a very colloquial kind of situation when we're reading this book no we want to be very shu when we're reading this and in that case we need to pronounce ing as ing ing guy the ing and not in, beginning. That's fine if you're just saying, well, I'm going now. Right after class, we're done with this fancy academic stuff. 
and you're leaving, say, well, I'm going now. No problem. That's fine. But not when you're reading the text. Okay, ing. Ing guy to ing, it's pretty easy to fix. Okay? Uh, the form and frequencies at the moment of release will be determined by the shape of the vocal tract as a whole. 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 Good. And hence will vary according to the vowel. Mm -hmm. The apparent point of origin of the formant for each place of articulation is called the locus of the place of articulation. Of. Of articulation. Of what? 那个之前的, of. Uh, of that mm -hmm. place of articulation. Good. All right. Something in bold, something for the test probably. Locus. Locus is simply the Latin word for 场所. It just means place, locus, location, right? That comes from that word. Locus is the idealized or imaginary source or origin of an articulation. So if you look, if you look at the bottom here, the spectrogram, you can see that these white lines that they put through the formants, 它好像是从比较低的地方, look at where I'm pointing here. Just right here, 它从比较低的地方往高一点的地方跑,对不对? So the locus must be somewhere down here. 想象中,它的起点可能是这里,直接往上到这里,等等。So, the point, the direction that these point to, they look like they are coming from. 它看起来好像是从那个地方来的。That is the locus. It's not a real place. It's just something that we imagine to visualize the changes in formants. Okay, that's the locus. Go on. The point of origin of the formants will depend on the adjacent vowels. Mm -hmm. It's almost perfect, except Jason, we don't need rounding. Look up. I hear adjacent for you, adjacent. adjacent. Now it's fine, and Kyla. Watch the just sounds. Just kind of smile, and they'll sound more Kyla. This is because the position of that part of the town. Tongue? Tongue Good. that is not involved in the formation of a consonant closure mm -hmm. will be largely that of the adjacent vowel. Very good, excellent. So, after the part on locus, it's just saying that where the formants begin will depend on. Because the muin will change how high or how low the formant is. So it Alright. Figure 8.7 shows spectrograms of the words bed, dead, and the noun word gag spoken by an American English speaker. You can see the faint voicing striations, Stri uh, striations mm -hmm. near the bla near the bass line for each of Once the Once more near the near the bass line. Line, uh-huh. Near the bass line for Good. each of the final stops, the, the, g. What do we have here? A typo. Should be? Oh, bed, dead, gig. Actually, no, it's not a typo. Usually they have, they have one of each of the three stops, but here they use the twice. Actually, it's not a typo. That's my mistake. I assumed they would have b, d, g, but they've actually got d, d, g, okay? Evidence of voicing near the bass line during, the, during a consonant closure is called a voice bar. We already learned about voice bar. It's that gray line at the bottom. You can see the striations, even if you're voicing. So it's still And usually it's quite gray because it's the rumbling of the vocal folds. But we will see it whenever there is voicing. Okay. Note that this speaker, like many other speakers of English, like many, like many other, mm? many other, mm -hmm. uh, can contrast. Many other. There we go. Like many other speakers. Huh? Of, speakers uh, like, 需要放中音吗? like many other speakers of English. Uh -huh. Many other speakers of English. Many other speakers of English. Good. Has no voice bars. No voice bars. Has no voice bars in the 
in the initials were a voice stops. There we go. Okay, you read beautifully. You've made a lot of changes. It makes it sound much more like a native speaker now. Um, I had a very silly image in my head when I saw voice bar and I heard myself saying it. A bar is a joba, right? So I imagined them serving up many kinds of voice, like like a falsetto and deep voice and like a normal voice. I imagine them serving in that at a bar. What kind of voice would you like? Well, I'd like a, a nice little falsetto, please. <laughs> you know? That's what I was thinking when I was reading Voice Bar, a place where you can dance. Um, tone So here it says, for the initial bus stops, and sometimes the following ones, the, the end ones as well, we don't see voicing during the stop. So when we're saying a word like listen and look, bed. 我现在是可以把voicing全部都讲出来了。Bed。Now that sounds ridiculous, and most Taiwanese don't even know of the existence of voicing with voice stops. But if I was really 可以, just like in the news when they use a very kind of, when they use a very Beijing kind of accent, they're over, overemphasizing the theoretical features of Chinese. Okay, 和所有的人, you know, they, they overemphasize it. Actually, underlyingly, it is those sounds, but in speech, in Taiwan becomes, you say, how, how do you say it? It's just like an H. It's right? So, in the news, we will probably, instead of we'll probably hear in the news, right? 就是播报新闻,常常会用这种发音, is that right or not? 对吗? Bella? No? It depends, oh, it depends, we don't listen to the news, okay? It depends on the broadcaster. If they are being very kouyu, they may not do that. But a lot of them will try to sound very authoritative and speak in a very formal kind of style. Then they will say heping instead of heping in the news. Although most people don't talk that way, we hear a lot of features that are present underlyingly in the language, but we don't use so much in colloquial language. So in the news, you'll hear, hear people saying billions of dollars, billions of dollars, billions of dollars. They will add a lot of voicing. Now, those sounds are voiced, but in colloquial speech in English, we don't usually voice them. We say billions of dollars, billions, jibu male voicing. So what they're saying is, here, we don't see voicing with the stops. Nigga voice bar. for a lot of these stops. In way, bed, bed, no voicing. If it's the first sound or the first word or first syllable of an utterance, we're just not going to have voicing. And for the final consonant, for the final stop, bed, we're not going to voice it that long. We'll voice it a little bit, but the second half is voiceless. So bed, I break it off fast. In theory, bed, but we break off the voicing, okay? Mm. How about if we finish a page before break? Next. In all three words, all, not all, all, all. Mm -hmm. in all three words, the first foreman rises from a low position. All right, let's start looking at what the foremans do in these words. Remember that this is bed, dead, and gag. Now, um, We'll see the first formant rising. Go ahead. That, that is not marked in white. The first formant, it does but I'll watch it. Go ahead. This is simply a mark of... Simply. Simply. Right. A mark of a stop closure and does not play a major part in distinguishing one place of articulation from another. All right. If you look at the dark bar at the bottom, which is not marked in white, can you look at my book up here for a minute? Here we've got... F2 and F3, F2, F3, F2, F3, they're marked in white. They do like a white line in the middle. This is F1 down here. Keep looking. This is F1 down here, which is not marked. The F1s look quite similar, don't they? All of them start a little bit low, and then they go up a little bit. All of them, all three of them. So it's stop because all the stops do the same thing. And the text just told us that it does not play a major part in distinguishing one place of articulation from another. It does tell us that it is a, louder? 
stop, right, this information is useful because we know that's a stop. All of them behave in the same way, so we know it's a stop, but we don't know which stop. Right, very good. Okay, it doesn't tell us which stop, it just tells us it's a, it's a stop. So if our goal now is to discriminate, is to distinguish which one is b, which one is d, and which one is g, do we need to bother with f1 very much? Not too much. It's not going to give us too much information, so we're going to look more closely at f2 and f3. Let's go on. What primarily distinguishes primarily primarily primary primarily primarily good distinguishes these three stops these three stops these three not this these these right three stops mm -hmm. are the onsets on onsets mm -hmm. and offsets of the second and third formants. We second and third formants contrast right second and third formants good which are traced with white lines. White? White lines. Is this a compound? White lines. There we go. You got it. OK. Actually, if you use the rules and you think you can get the right pronunciation, it takes time. And we, we take time in class to do this. When you are speaking with other people, you don't have that time. So you have to, once you know the rules and practice them, well, that's it. You have to practice them over and over again. Then they will come naturally. You won't have to think about it. You will just know white lines sounds weird. Ah, white lines, because it's not a compound. So it's saying that <clears throat> what are onsets? What's another word for onsets? Right, good, the beginnings. And offsets are the? The endings, good. So the way we can tell the three different places of articulation apart from each other is through the beginnings and the endings of F2 and F3. Go ahead. At the beginning of the word bed, 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 right? The second and third formants have a lower frequency than they do at the beginning of the word dead. All right. So when we're at the beginning of bed, that's the first one. Look at F two and F three. How did she dian? Subisubi di arga spectrogram, dead. The nega chi dian hayao di, yo mei. Because of the b, right? The closed lips are lowering the formant. So we can see that starting from a lower point helps us to identify b from, or to distinguish b from d. Let's go on. The second formant is noticeably. 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 Uh, listen. Noticeably. Notice. Noticeably. 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 You have to do it a little faster. Notice, noticeably. Noticeably. <laughs> mm -hmm. The second formant is noticeably noticeably. Not There's still an uh, but it has to be fast. Mm -hmm. Rising for the initial b from b, b mm -hmm. from a comparatively low locus. In the word dead. In the word dead. In the word dead. Mm -hmm. The second formant is fairly steady. 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 Everyone steady. Steady. Mm. Eh, right. Steady. <laughs> At the beginning and the at the beginning and the, at the beginning, and the third formant drops a little. All right. The second formant is noticeably rising for the initial b in the word dead. And this is the second spectrogram. F two, 它一开始的时候是往上往下还是持平？一开始的时候是往上往下还是持平？ For b, it's 往上，对不对？起头的时候，它是往上。可是 d 的时候 ，f2 是往上、往下还持平，持平 ，right? It's level, it's even. Okay. In gig, the second and third formants come close to each other. Come close to each other. Come close to each other. Good. At the margins of the vowel, where the g consonants have the most influence. Influence over the formant frequencies. It is almost as if the F2 and F3. F, not F, F. F2 mm -hmm. and F3. Good. We're going to a common, common point. Mm -hmm. This coming together of the second and third formants, sometimes called. Sometimes. Sometimes called a villa. Called pause. Called a villa pinch. Mm -mm. Villa. Pinch. Right, and we need to slow down. If it's in 粗体字, 
Is it extra important? Yeah. When something's important, always slow down. It's something new for your listener. So they need more time to absorb and process the information. Sometimes called a velar pinch, slow it down so it's clear. Some, sometimes. sometimes called a velar pinch Good. is very characteristic of velar consonants. And we talked about velar pinch before. Remember I told you that's your friend when you're reading spectrograms? Because if you see that F2 and F3 are coming together, then we know that that particular place of articulation is velar. Velar pinch. That is so useful. Because if you're looking at a spectrogram and you're panicking, it just looks like a bunch of smudgy lines, find the velar pinches and you know you've got velar articulations. Okay? So it's really useful. All right. We'll take our break. All right. Now we're going to try and push. I will try not to slow you down too much, but I still will point things out. Let's... Get back to page 200. That's a milestone. Page 200. No, there, it doesn't, it goes up to a little over 300, but that's the glossary and stuff. So that means there are less than 100 pages left to deal with. That's something. Okay, our next reader. The corresponding voice that stops. What would we stress here? You read it with, um, what we would call basic sentence intonation. 就是一个新的话题的第一句话, we use basic sentence intonation. The rules of that are stress all of the content words, right? Stress the content words, and you did it correctly. However, this is not completely out of context because we were just talking about voiced consonants, voiced stops, right? And now we're talking about so is there a contrast? Right. So can we adjust accordingly? Uh, the, the corresponding voice stops. Okay, we don't need to go so high on corresponding because when we're going to have contrast, So the corresponding, it's going to be somewhere here in the middle. At the end, it goes much lower. So the corresponding voiceless stops, da 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 that's what we do when we're contrasting. When it's unstressed before the tonic stress, you can put this in your notes. Tonic stress 之前没有中音是什么呈现？是中平调，中平，不是很高也不很低。So the corresponding, this is about the middle of my speaking range. The corresponding voiceless, that's low in my range. So middle. High for the tonic, then we go down low. After the tonic, we have deep ping diao. Before the tonic, we have zhong ping diao. I don't think I've told that to you before, although I've um, demonstrated it to you. So zhong ping diao, tonic, deep ping diao, okay? The corresponding voice that stops Good. Put, uh, Good. Put, put, uh, are illustrated in figure 8.8 .8 in the form fem, ten, and kang. Okay, so PEM, here we have homorganic consonants, P and M, then we have TEN, and then we have KING, which has velar raising, KING. So at least these are more consistent. The first one should have been, to make it a little more consistent, the first one instead of being BED should have been BEB, DEAD, GEG, would have been better in my opinion. I'm not sure why they did that, maybe they wanted a real word, but GEG is not a real word. These are not real words except for ten is a real word. So pem, ten, king. Okay, and he explains. Of which only ten? Of which only ten. It's in xie ti zi, so put this in your notes. When you see xie ti zi, it's important. It's just like zu ti zi. You're going to have to isolate it. That means pause a bit, make it very emphatic, and then we leave, usually we leave a pause before and after. So of which only ten, is an English word. Of which only ten <coughs> is an English word. Is an English, oh sorry, this is the end of the sentence, is an English word. Uh, we choose these forms because the vowel. We choose these forms. Zeixie, here it's emphatic. We use there's a little contrast here. We choose these forms because the vowel. We choose these forms, okay, try it again. We choose these forms because. 
listen, 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 echo. We choose these forms. I didn't emphasize it as much as I thought I did. We choose these forms because... We choose these forms because... You're making it really short. You go, we choose these forms. When you do something really short, people think it's not important. Yeah. Chose. It's chose. It's chose. That's right. Choose and chose, okay? But here it should be chose, you're right. So we chose these forms. We chose these forms. Slow down. We chose these forms because the vowel a is a particularly good environment for showing stop consonant. For showing. For showing. Good. Sh not sh show. Showing. Showing. Good. Stop consonant place of articulation differences. All right. You have two instances of a similar issue. Particule. It's Q, not Q. Particule and also, <coughs> also articulation. So try again. Particularly. Particularly. Q. Make the Q really strong. Particularly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And articulation. Articulation. There we go. As with unaspirated stops, the release of the aspirated stops is marked by a sudden sharp spike. Sudden sharp spike? Sudden sharp spike? Good. That's good timing. Use that timing for your reading. Sudden sharp spike corresponding to the, uh, to the onset of a burst of noise. Good. Okay. After the, re uh, after the release burst, there is the period. The release burst. Now it was no problem with stress. Just you're giving it short shrift. You, you, you wouldn't taekwila. After the release burst, they're important words. and Make them a little longer. After the release burst, mm -hmm. there is the period of aspiration noise marked by absence of energy in F1 and absence of, uh, and absence of the regular vertical regular, uh, regular, 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 regular yeah. Yeah. vertical striations of voicing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the aspiration noise separates the burst from the, the burst, the burst mm -hmm. from the voiced portion of the vowel. Portion, right. Let's look down at the bottom. <clears throat> so, it says, first of all, in the first one, we're talking about PEM. Is that what they're talking about here? I think so. In any case, you can see after the release, we have some aspiration. So, PEM. You see those very light markings? Right? The very light markings of the formants? 那是没有什么,没有没有voicing,你看下面完全没有voice There's no voicing at all. So there's no voicing, but we're still seeing the formants because even though there's no voicing, there's no vibration of the vocal folds, that aspiration is still making those resonances vibrate a bit. So even though it's completely voiceless, there's no voice bar, bar at all, you can still see the formant markings. Okay? And it says, after the release burst, there's a period of aspiration noise marked by absence of energy in F1. F1, look at F1, you see nothing down there. You do see some markings in F2, F3, and F4. And absence of regular vertical striations of voicing. We still see markings there, but they're not regular voicing striations until about at the release. Okay, and the aspiration noise separates the burst from the voice portion of the vowel. So during the aspiration, we've just got fricative noise, and then the vowel starts. Go. The aspiration noise separates the burst from the voiced portion of the, voiced the portion. vowel. The voiced, the voiced portion. portion of the vowel. Right. The burst for P, P, P has the lowest frequency. All right, let's keep remembering these things. So, P, the burst. If you look at where the black markings are concentrated for p, then compare them to t and p. You'll see that, look up here. You see that here, 它这边都蛮淡的. But when we get to t, we see some noise up here. And then we also see a lot of noise up there for k as well. So we have the lowest frequencies for p. Okay. For both t and k, the noise extends above the 4,000 hertz. The above the 4,000 hertz shown in the spectrogram 
as we will see in later figures. In later? In later figures. Figures, watch figures. the year, right. So now you can see that at the 4,000 mark, they don't have it marked, but it's right up here. Then just a zai above 3,000, we get to 4,000. You can see that for t and for k, we've got a lot of noise there that was cut off. They cheered out. Bidahai gao de noise, eating yo. We only see a cut off part at the bottom. Okay? The highest frequencies are actually in the t burst rather than the k. All right, so now we have a lot of information about bursts after voiceless stops. This is important in reading spectrograms. So the lowest frequencies probably mark which stop? P. The highest ones mark t. And then a little bit lower than t, we get k. Good. If you whisper a sequence of consonants, t, 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 k, 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 p, 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 in that order, t, k, p, you can hear that the highest pitch is associated with t the next with k, and the lowest with p. You can also hear that t. You can also hear. Uh, you can also hear that t is the loudest. Is the loudest. Is the loudest. Right. K, next loudest. Next loudest. Next loudest. Con we have contrast here. Yeah. Next lo loudest, and p, the least loud. The intensity of the p burst is sometimes so low that there is hardly any evidence of a sharp spike in the spectrogram. All right, let's try that now. First of all, uh, we just said which was the highest. Which is the highest of the three? So we're talking about pitch now. And then, and then, P has the lowest pitch. In addition to pitch, if we're talking about intensity, is it the same? Is it the same as the pitch levels? Highest, medium, lowest? It says in your book, T is the loudest, then K, then P. So both intensity and pitch, they follow the same sequence, right? So we have and let's do that little exercise, three of each of the voiceless stops in that order. Listen for highest pitch and loudest volume and going steadily down in both pitch and volume. Go ahead. Go backwards. You can hear it really clearly, right? So, pitch and volume in that same order. Go on. Since the formant, uh, since the formant transitions after voiceless aspirated stops, voiceless aspirated stops, uh, voiceless aspirated stops and stops take place during the period, uh, during the period of aspiration. 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 Mm -hmm. They are not as uh, apparent in Figure 8.8 .8 as they are after the voiced stops in figure 8.7. Let's compare. Because they are voiceless, we're not going to see those formant transitions quite as clearly. So if you look at 8.7, 它那个起点,由下往上,或者持平,或者由上往下, those are all really clear with the voice stops, right? But they're a little bit grayed out in the case of voiceless stops because we don't have voicing to make the formants really clear. But they're there. Okay? Kaima, let's go on. However, we have traced the centers of F2 and F3 in, this, uh, in these spectrograms to help you see help. To help, yep. help you see <coughs> that the formants are also present in the aspiration noise. Good. In addition, the transitions into the final nasals from the vowels uh, from the vowels before them are easily visible. The second and third are easily visible. Uh, are easily visible. Mm -hmm. The second and third formants are falling slightly before m. Let's look at that. For the first one, pem, f2, and f3. Right when we're getting to m, 会往下. 
For F3, it looks like it's going up. It is going up. 可是最后快要念出嗯的时候，它有点下降，一点点。Okay, and the second and third formants are almost level before mm. Can we see that in ten, F2 and F3 还蛮持平，没有什么变化。And most distinct,、uh, distinctive of all. Of all. Of all. 很强调 ，remember if it's something is very emphatic, then we're going to need to emphasize it. Most distinctive of all, the second and third formants are coming together. Oh, second and third 没那么重要 ，because those are repeated. The second and third formants are 不一样的地方在哪里呢 ？Coming together， 那个是有 contrast 的地方。The second and third formants are coming together、mm -hmm. for the velar pin、uh, for the velar pinch before n.、Mm. Very good. Before n,、mm. n、mm、is a is a noun. And that's our that's our tonic stress before um.、Mm. Yeah, I know it's kind of awkward because it's just a,、uh, it's it's just a syllabic nasal.、Um, so we can see that that F two and F three are coming together. So velar pinch is going to be a joke after a while because the one thing we can often see really clearly is velar pinch. So what do we have here? Everybody says velar pinch, and you will experience that soon. Let's go on. The nasal consonants um um. Mm, are also illustrated in Figure 8.8. A clear mark of a nasal, or of a nasal, a, of a nasal, or as or, we will see, or as we will see, a clear mark of a nasal, or as we will see, a lateral consonant okay. Mm, okay. is an ab abrupt change in spectrogram at in the, the in the spectrogram. At the time of the formation of the articulatory closure of the articulatory、Oops. closure of the articulatory closure. Oh, 不要那么高 Closure is still a, a a content word of the articulatory closure of the articulatory closure. Good. Another one. Watch my mouth. Change. That's fine now. I hear change. It's going too round.、Um, I'm being very picky. And spectrogram. Watch the S. Spectrogram. Spectrogram. Now it's fine. Each of the nasals has a formant structure similar formant. to. Formant. 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 Uh huh. One reason. Well, I'm pretty picky with all of you because I think you're not going to get a chance to have this stuff pointed out. Maybe it gets kind of tedious after a while. And one student in freshman English said at the beginning, I was really excited about trying to fix my pronunciation and. Learn English, but getting corrected all the time has lowered my motivation. So I have to think about that too. But I know that Carol takes really careful notes about every correction, and so I'm thinking that you know how to appreciate it. So I'm going to keep on giving you a lot of detailed information.、Um, formant, yeah, is a、um, is a schwa here, and right. Be really paying attention to the information he's giving you now. Of course, every sentence in Latifoga Johnson is important. Joseph Paul Bedell. However, now he's teaching you how to read spectrograms, and we're going to have to read a spectrogram soon. So we've learned about velar pinch. We've learned about how if we have a bilabial before a vowel, it's usually going to start start high or low, low and go up. If it's a <laughs> alveolar, 可能是持平 but it depends on what vowel it's going to, and if it's A velar. We've got velar pinch. That's reliable. Now we're learning a new bunch of signs to watch out for when we're reading spectrograms. The formants of nasals and laterals are somewhat similar to vowels, but we're going to see some formants disappearing. Those are like anti-formants, 就不见了 And we're going to see some particular nasal and lateral formants. But the main thing to watch out for is what that he just told you. Two things that are related. Second line: When we enter a nasal from a vowel going into a nasal, what are we going to see in the spectrogram right away? That's number one. There's a big change immediately. So 突然间就断层了，就断掉了 Watch out for this. This is important to know because when you're reading spectrograms, you're going to panic and think, "Oh, what did he, what did he tell us about spectrograms?" Make a little list so when we're reading spectrograms, you'll be ready with these sets of features that you can use. To find 
certain sounds or types of sounds on a spectrogram. And one is when you're going into a nasal, immediately, it's suddenly, there's a fault, there's a break off. And related to that, you're going to see lighter formants. Formants, sorry. Um, and that's because we're closing off our mouth, right? So from ah to mm, coming through the nose instead. So you will see that the formants, they're going to be placed a little differently, they're going to be lighter, and there's a very abrupt change. Go on. Each of the nasal has a format. Each of the each of the nasals right. has a format structure, mm -hmm. has a format structure right. similar to that of a vowel, except the band, uh, except that the bands are fainter, fainter. and fainter. Are fainter. Everyone. Good. Except that the bands are fainter, and are in particular frequency locations that depend on the characteristic resonance of the nasal cavities. Characteristic. Characteristic um, resonance uh, resonances. There we go. Of the nasal cavities. All right. Now he's going to tell you. In addition to seeing an abrupt break off or change and lighter formants, which look similar to vowels, but I told you some things are going to be missing, and they're also going to be marked by characteristic nasal. Uh, areas of energy for nasals. I should rephrase that. You will find that there are particular formants with nasals in a very particular place. It's just typical of nasals. They will have a particular nasal formant or informants. 它特定的地方会有一些energy会显现出来,那就是nasal And he's going to tell you where to look. In nasal consonants, there is usually a very low first formant centered at about 250 hertz. All right, now look back on 8.8 .8 at the end of each articulation where we've got nasals. You will probably find some energy right around 250 hertz. That's about one quarter of the way up to 1,000, right? That's a typical nasal frequency, around 250 hertz. So you need to add that to your list. If you see suddenly some light formants and extra energy around 250 hertz, it's probably a nasal. We don't know which one, but it's a nasal. Okay? That's why spectrograms are very useful for many things, but they're not very useful for distinguishing one nasal from another. nasal nasal. Spectrogram it probably will tell you a velar nasal because of velar pinch, because the other is not very clear. The location of the higher, the location of the the higher formants varies, but generally there is a large region above the first format with no energy. Do you see that now? Look at the end again of the words in Figure Eight Point Eight. Above that, it looks like a, a sort of a relatively lighter. At the bottom, we have a voice bar. 最下面的最黑的那个是voice bar. You better look at my finger so you know what I'm talking about. 最下面的是voice bar. Around 250 hertz. That's the nasal formant, the typical nasal formant. And right above that, there's this big white space. There's nothing there. And that's because of anti-resonances. 我们在发nasal的时候, 我们刚好会抵消掉一些vowel本来会有的formant frequencies. 我们就是因为舌头放的位置,然后不用嘴巴,我们就会抵消掉原来会有的一些vowel formants. Okay? So that white space, 不是很被动的, nothing interesting. 是很主动的, that means there's a nasal with an anti-resonance. There's an anti-resonance there. 就是被抵消掉的一些resonance,本来存在, this speaker has a second, rather faint nasal, rather faint, rather faint mm -hmm. nasal format at nasal format, nasal format around two thousand hertz. All right, and if you look at PEM in Figure Eight Point Eight, above two thousand hertz, we still do see a little faint bit of energy there. 
So above 2,000 hertz, 在此位的地方, everybody see this, where I'm pointing? It's above 2,000 hertz, it's getting, it's probably about 2,300 or so. We see some energy there, okay? The differences between each of the nasals is often determinable from the different formant mm -hmm. trans from the different or from the different formant transitions Good. that are that occur at the end of each vowel. Good, that occur pause at suggestitsu. So when you get to the end of the vowel, as we noticed, we're gonna see movement in the formants, either down or straight or velar pinch. So it's the end of the vowel, if there's a nasal coming after it, it's the end of the vowel that's going to give us the most information. Okay? There is a, decre there is a decrease in the second format of the vowels. Form formant. Formant. Right. Formant of the vowel before m. Oh, everybody see it? So F2, we can see F2 going down, as we mentioned. F2 of m mm, is the first, the first utterance. Okay. And formats two and three are coming together for the velar, for the velar pinch before the velar nasal at the end of king. But the space cues Once are. More. But but the place but the but the place cues are sometimes not very clear. Mm -hmm. R not a R. R. Good. So that's what I just said. We find that for m, we sometimes get a Q in the form of a descending format, F2, Wangxia. This is Then, velar pinch tells us we've got a velar. But for T and D, it's not very clear. And M is not always, either that, uh, not always that clear either. So that's why I said spectrograms are good for all kinds of things, for getting all kinds of information, but not very good at distinguishing one nasal from another, not that good, not that reliable. The, que the cues are often not that clear and unambiguous. The examples that they give you in the text, remember that the higher formants have been what, first of all? They've been darkened, right, so we can see them clearly. So when you make your own spectrograms, they will also make the adjustments automatically. The person who, the people who do, designed the software, they have already done that, so you will probably also get Fairly dark formants, but that has been adjusted. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, it really depends on the vowel. So the cues will not always be clear. And they made the examples in the book especially clear for you to try to teach you how it works. But when you see a real spectrogram of just running speech, you will probably panic at the beginning. But don't worry, it can be managed. It's just not as clear. They give you the clearest examples as a zoom in, but then it gets not so clear later on, okay? Figure 8.9 shows the words phi, thai, sai, shai, illustrating the voiceless fricatives. Uh, the frequency scale for these, for these spectrograms has been increased, bin, bin. Has, been, has been increased to 8,000 hertz. Hertz? Hertz, uh, as the highest frequencies in Speech occurred speech. in speech. That's the end of the subject. Remember that? End of the subject. In speech, speech occurred during fricatives. In s s sounds, uh, the random noise extends well beyond the upper limits of, of even this spectrogram. All right, so we covered this actually in a previous class. We've suddenly changed our scale. For vowels, we only needed to go up to 4,000 4, hertz was enough, but now we've doubled our scale. We go all the way up to 8,000. That has the advantages of showing us energy at higher frequencies, and we need that for what class of sounds? Fricatives, right? However, how do we have to pay? It's going to be compressed. So the information below is going to be compressed, a little less clear. But we need to do this in order to see the energy. And is 8,000 hertz enough to see everything that's going on with fricatives? Look at the third figure here, the third and the fourth figure. Based on what you see here, 
Does it look like 8,000 hertz gives us all the information about the fricatives? Looks like it was cut off right at the middle or somewhere because there's more energy above that that we're not recording. But we, we already get the idea. We don't need all of the information. If we make the range too high, we're going to compress the bottom too much and it will be too unclear. So we've compromised. We've cut off some of the higher areas of energy, but we've added enough so we can see the energy of, of fricatives, at least partly. Let's go on. The spectrogram of the first word, phi, shows the diphthong. The, the. Shows the, the diphthong that, that occurs. That occurs. That occurs in each of these, these words. Very good. All right, phi. And everybody remembers what phi means? It's a Shakespearean word. When somebody's really angry, phi, guys, something like that. <laughs> 他的那个严重度可能从讨厌到该死, or worse. Yeah, phi. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an expression of anger or disgust. Okay? The first and second formants in this diphthong start close together in the position for a low, for a low central vowel. Very good. Let's look at the first spectrogram, that's phi. Now, right at the beginning, we have f which is one of the quieter fricatives, ta in yang bi jiao xiao. The quietest sound in English, do you remember I mentioned? F, th, voiceless th, that's the very quietest. F is louder than th, but not a lot, not a lot louder. So, right, what do we have at the beginning of phi? The first and second formants start close together in the diphthong in the position for a low central vowel. So F1 and F2, um, 它那个并拢,它就是那个放在一起,靠得很近. And then, 后面它会分开来. So, we're talking about the vowel now, everybody look where I'm pointing. So, at the beginning of a, ah, it's close to a schwa. And then, as we get further along in the diphthong, the bottom one stays pretty much the same, F1, but F2 goes up to make E. Remember, F2 is high for E, right? F2, E, hengao. So, 会插开来,会分开来,and F2 gets higher. So that's typical of this particular diphthong. Let's go on. Mm, they then move apart. They then move apart. They then move apart so that at the end of the diphthong, they are in locations similar to those in, e, in figure 8.3. Mm -hmm. Figure. Figure. Everyone, figure. All right, let's practice the British one, figure. figure. The British, figure. figure. American, figure. figure. Good. Let's look quickly at 8.3, just to remind ourselves. And that is on page, I see 8.4 here. Oh, here we go. Um, 8.3, it's on 194. It's CD 8.3. There's your chulu. Actually, you want 8.4. And look at I, right? So low F1, pretty high F2. F3 is not too much higher than F2. And that's what we have here. 对不对? But you can see F2 going high, getting close to F3. Go ahead. As the formant pattern for the diphthong is the same in phi, thai, sai, shai. Oh, shai. Shai. Right. Only the first. Oh, only. Only. You're doing kind of British O. Oh. O. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Only. The first part has been shown for been. the. Has been. Ha has been. Mm -hmm. Has been shown for the last three words. Good. All of you are reading really beautifully. I can really, really hear your improvement. Um, B E E N in American, in, in U.S. English. Bin. Bin. Not bing. Bin. 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 All right, Canada, UK, Australia. Bean. 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 But not bing. Homian busiga velar nasal. It's bean. bean. Has been. Has been. That's Canada, UK, etc. US, bin. bin. All right, now it's not 100% of all speakers who do this, but that's So the first spectrogram. 
is a lot wider for phi because why? Show the diphthong. Why? To show the diphthong. That's right. We're showing the diphthong in phi, and we cut it off in the other three because it's the same. So we're just, <coughs> excuse me. This is our, we're applying information theory. If we have redundant information, repeated information, that's the way information works in all areas, not just language. So we're saving space, so we concentrate, and we can also focus better on what we want to look at. Mm. Okay, next reader. All these these sounds have these these all these sounds Not, oh all all there we go these sounds have random energy distributed over a wide range of frequencies. Good. All right. Two things I want to point out. First of all, energy. Watch your e. Eh. Don't say energy. Energy. Good, energy, and the other one is over a wide range of frequencies. We're coming into the tonic stress, the important information. Slow down and give it a nice rolling rhythm. All these sounds have random energy, right? Distributed over a wide range of frequencies. Compare that to this. Listen and feel your guys. So, all these sounds have random energy distributed over a wide range of frequencies. Did you get the zhong dian? When we read that fast, we're not going to catch the zhong dian. So make it long, expansive, and rolling. All these sounds have random energy. That's important. Random energy. This is very important. Distributed. Then we have a jie xi so we have to slow down, pause. Over a wide range of frequencies. That's new information. It's very important. Because in the past, no, not in the past, up until now, We've been focusing mainly on hen zai de yiga range. Mo yiga frequency fu jin jiu yu energy. But now it's not just a single frequency, it's yi dui, jiu shi ta hen guang fan de yiga qu yu. Ta jiu fen pei zai ge hen guang fan de qu yu. This is the first time we've had to deal with that. Because with vowels, things are much narrower and more focused. We have this ringing resonance. But when we have noise, it's, at least so far, it's voiceless. And it's many different frequencies at once. And last semester, remember, we defined noise as many different frequencies being found in the speech signal at once. The speech, speech signal, signal, frequencies. That's noise. If we focus it, it's clear and resonant. Ah, we have a very clear pitch. But shh. It's in a very, very high part of the range, but it's scattered over a very large part of that high part of the range. Okay? That's typical of um, voiceless, um, of all kinds of fricatives, and with voiceless fricatives especially, because we're missing the voice part of it. Did you want to say something, Carol? No. Okay. <laughs> to do okay, write it down so you don't forget it again. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> in f in f the pattern is much, much the same. What much is the same? Much, Mo the, much same. the same. Sorry, end of the sentence. Once more. Ian, do that sentence again. I missed something. In f in th the pattern is much the same. 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 Start higher. Not, don't jiao wang guo zheng. You're going to yi now. We don't want to go quite to yi. It's much the same. Just like say, shuo hua nega say. Make it long. Same. same. Make it longer, the vowel. There we go. Yeah. What distinguishes these these two words? These two words. These two words mm -hmm. is is the movement of the second form. Don't go too far down on movement because we're not done yet. Is the movement of the second form is not the movement because then we think we're done. But we need to connect to what's coming better. Is the movement movement of the second form into the following vowel? These two words is the movement of the second formant into the following vowel, vowel marked by arrows. Marked R. Marked mm -hmm. by arrows in the fig All figure. All right. Very good. Everyone marked. A lot of you say marked. You're missing the R after A sounds especially marked. 
And so we know that for fricatives like f and th, we're going to have lots and lots of frequencies present in the speech signal. And what distinguishes the two is the movement of the second formant into the following vowel. All right, look at F2. We're talking about f and th. Those are the first two. So look at F2 going into the vowel. We can see that for f to look at the beginning here. The beginning of f is here. Here's f. And here we're going into the vowel. And ping. But for f, what do you see at the beginning of f2? Compare f and th. Compare the f2 and those two. What do you see that's a little different? Right at the beginning. Right at the beginning of the a ah vowel. Can you see a difference between F2 and the two figures? It seems to go up a bit. Right. In th, it seems to be going up a teeny tiny bit. And how about in th? It starts a bit higher and is going down a little bit. Now, these are tiny little things. If you just look at them, they all look pretty much the same. But now you're going to see all of these little differences. They make big differences, actually. So for f, it's going up a teeny tiny bit, but mostly it stays the same. But in the, this, go ahead. Uh, continue. There's, we'll just finish. There's very little movement in f, but the, f, the second format starts around, at around 1,200 hertz. All right, find that. Is that right? Okay. And moves down. And moves down. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Because the differences between these two sounds are so small. Between these two sounds. Between these two sounds Good. are so small. 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 Okay. They are often confused in noise, noisy settings, and they have fallen together as one sound in some accents of English, such as London Cockney, which does not distinguish between thing and thing. Very good. We finished this paragraph, so. Next time, it's going to be Wendy who starts, right? Wendy? She's not here today. So Wendy, next time. And uh, just to complain, the, uh, complain. <laughs> just to, uh, just to um, explain, not complain. I, maybe I'm complaining that Wendy isn't here. That's what I was complaining about. Mm, just to explain this last part, the differences are not huge. We had to look closely and then be really looking for them to find them. And in fact, in actual speech, the differences are not that clear. And as a further further evidence of this, in some accents of English, and it's getting more and more common. I've told you before in class, first semester, a lot of people say one, two, free in British English. One, two, free. One, two, free for three. So th in British English, it may eventually be replaced by f. It's already happening. We don't do it as much in American English, except some dialects do. Like in black English, some people do it. And probably some southern accents, I'm not sure. But free people, you hear that in non-standard dialects. Not in standard American very much now. It may happen, but it's happening much sooner in British English. So one, two, free. Mm. OK, we'll start there next time. So for Wednesday, what do you need to do? Vowels and consonants, <laughs> chapter eight. That's easy to remember, same as the other book. And make sure that the logarithms tutorial is finished. It's mainly, I think, um, Jerome, because he's missed class, because he's been not, not been well. And we may do some web pages on Wednesday, and probably the tutorial on, on decibels next Monday, probably, if all goes well. And. Also, what do you have to put in your notes for Monday? What's the additional thing to put in? Shida. Yeah, the 11th article. And that's it. We'll see you on Wednesday.